Tom is going to spend most of our time uh, this morning in the class, but I asked him if I could uh, just speak for a little bit before we uh, get going in his direction. And uh, the reason I, I, I wanted to is just as I thought back over uh, things, um, there are just a couple of points that I thought, I, I just wish I'd, I'd, I'd made these points last week, and so I, I want to try to make them this week. But before I do that, I'll open us in prayer, and then we'll, we'll get started this morning. So let's, let's pray. Father, thank you again for the chance we have to gather together as a church and uh, think through things, to uh, consider what it is that you have uh, laid before us to do, including uh, why we exist, what we want to be about, and, and these kinds of things as Tom will discuss. And, and so we do pray, as we have for a few weeks now, that you'll just continue to uh, guide us in uh, unity and just pour out your grace upon us, for we are in desperate need of that. And we ask all of this for our good and for the honor of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> kind of the main thing I, I wanted to say is I know that if you've been with us for a, for a long time, uh, so if you've been part of this church for a good while, you may feel like with some of the things that we've been uh, talking through over these last few weeks, you may think, man, it feels like things are really changing. And, and so I just wanted to say, in one sense... Uh, perhaps that's true. We're recommending um, uh, hiring Tom, recommending building changes. We're, we're going to uh, try small groups once the summer starts, those kinds of things. And so in that sense, uh, it is true that there are some same things changing. But in another sense, I just wanted to point out that these are a fulfillment of principled things that we've wanted to be about from our beginning. So first, let me just, just note the, in one sense, I, I didn't want to argue uh, things aren't changing. Take, take, for example, even the growth that Nate talked about the first week and accommodating for that. Um, uh, if you start from the beginning, uh, back in, you know, whenever, I think we started uh, in 2003 or something when Nate showed you those numbers on the board. But if you were to go back a bit farther, uh, there was one point where uh, we were quite small. And from that point forward, we've grown on average, I think the numbers Nate showed, was 16 and a half people a year. So in one sense, it's not as if because we're making plans to open up this room into the sanctuary, all of a sudden, uh-oh, we're growing in, in a different way than we ever have. No, this has been a consistent thing. And it's always seemed that the Lord has any step where we've sought out and said, God, we, we're going to try to obey you in this way. It seems that at every point we've done that, the Lord has blessed us with more, drawing more individuals into the church. So if you go back way back in our history... Uh, there was a point where we had 45 members, and actually that number had come down from a bigger number, and it was a, a rough time in, in my life. Uh, one of the consistent things that was happening then is, uh, with our 45 church members is it would be payday for me. And um, the secretary would say, we don't have enough money to write you a check, so what do we do? And so I would just say, uh, well, what do you mean, what do we do? You can't just write me a check. That doesn't mean anything, so let's wait. So we would take an offering, a very low number, just a small crowd of us. Well, Nate became an elder soon after that, and there was one night we were in an elders meeting, and uh, we were talking, and, and it was Nathan and Jonathan Douglas, someone that some of you may know, others may not know him at all because he's moved, uh, but the three of us were become elders, and Nathan had just become an elder, like the Sunday prior to that meeting. We were meeting on, on say, a Thursday night or something. We were together, and one of the things I pointed out to the guys, I said, you know, if, if I think back over our history, I think... I think there's something that we just didn't handle biblically. And we walked forward, but I think the principles that we walked forward, they weren't in accord with the Bible. And so we talked about it, and we said, you know what, it seems that we need to repent for that. And so Nathan said, yeah, let's stand up before the church and repent. And I was like, what's this let's business, Nate? You, are, you just became an elder on Sunday, you know? Um, and he said, no, but we stand together. And so sure enough, that next Sunday night, uh, the elders got together and we stood before the church and said, we just want to repent about something. We've, we've tried to lead you in biblical ways, but in this one area, we don't think we follow biblical principles. So we stood before the church and repented. Nate, again, I, I just remember this. Again, he had, he had just become an elder the previous Sunday, and we're standing up there repenting of this, and Nate has tears rolling down his face, you know. And uh, he wasn't even part of it, actually. But after that, like the next month, I had a new members class, and... 15 people came to it. They all ended up joining the church. 
So on one Sunday, our membership went from 45 to 60. And so if there's ever a time to freak out about growth, that was it right there. Um, it was a 33% increase. We've never seen anything like that before. And, but it did send a message to us that uh, the Lord is bestowing grace on us even as we obey. Then Nathan did point out when we did the church plan in Martin, again, just consider our average growth, net membership increase every year, 16. In the year following the church plant in Martin, our net membership increase was 37. And in fact, I asked, um, I talked to a guy at NAM uh, this week. Actually, some of you may, may know him, Shane Kritzer. Uh, it went to Union, but I talked to him this week and I said, our experience has been uh, that we planted a church and then we really grew numerically. And I said, and I've talked to a couple other people and they've said the same thing. And Brian Freeman uh, asked two weeks ago, is this kind of thing common? So I asked Shane and, and Shane said, yes. He said, in fact, uh, the thing that, the, that NAM is trying to tell churches is uh, if, you, um, if you want to stop growing, then don't have any kind of strategy for planting churches. But if you do, he said he was at a church that planted 10 churches in 10 years and really couldn't stop growing. Um, so it does seem to be that this is the way the Lord's work. So in some ways, where we are now is in no way different from where we've been uh, for the last number of years. The Lord just seems to uh, consistently add to our number, and we're just now at a point where we need to modify for that. Uh, another thing that I wanted to note that is in no way changing is our commitment to oversight. Um, you know, we, there of course is, when there's only 45 of you, uh, oversight can be done in a, in a different way. I mean, our, our Sunday evening service, when there are 45 of us, we literally met sitting on the floor in the main office. Not, not my office, the one across the hall, with the desks still in there. We just rounded up and then we moved on to Glenn and Barbara Perry's living room. I mean, so now we're in this big tiered room. Uh, so of course, uh, oversight and how you do it, it changes over time how we figure out how do you oversee 45 people versus 100 people. Um, but one of the things we've been committed to is Hebrews 13, 17. And uh, this is a, a text that says of the leaders of the church. It says to the church, obey your leaders and submit to them for their keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Uh, this verse has meant a lot to us. It's meant that uh, we're responsible to give an account to make sure that all the ones the Lord has put under our care persevere until the end. Another thing we've consistently said is, unless the people oversee one another, we will fail in the task that we've been charged with to oversee the people. In other words, if it's, if it's simply dependent on the elders being able to pull this off, we can't do it. We need the people involving themselves in each other's lives. We've referred also to Hebrews uh, 3, 12 through 14, that, that says of the church, ask the church to encourage one another every day so that we're not hardened by the sin, deceitfulness of sin. We've asked the church to involve themselves in each other's lives, to, to oversee one another, and uh, so that, that at the end of the day, we can give an account. When we consider small groups, really the way small groups works in our mind is this way. For a long time, we've assumed the church has been overseeing each other. Well, because Hebrews 13, 17 means something uh, important to us, though, that we really will give an account to make sure people have persevered well in the faith, we don't want to just assume that anymore. Uh, so small groups, in, in, in a way, they're simply a step to make sure Hebrews 3 is happening in order to make sure we can be faithful to obey Hebrews 13. So this is, this is simply uh, living out our principles. The, the recommendation we'll make tonight of hiring Tom. It's not as if we've changed from we want to minister to people. No, we want to stop doing that. We want to just do this. Now, obviously, bringing in Tom is a means of saying we want the pastors to be free to be able to minister to people. And then finally, next week, Aaron will talk a bit to you about, uh, we've asked Aaron to talk a bit about uh, the apprenticeship program because we're looking at some changes in that, in that program. Um, but in the apprenticeship, it's just a, a reality that's come about because of the commitment that we've had for years. That we want to be able to train up uh, pastors and, and missionaries so that we can uh, send them out and affect the world. And so the thing that just hit me this week is the thing that I wish I'd made clear last week is, though it feels like there's a lot of new stuff, 
This is really just a fulfillment of the things, the principled convictions we've had from the beginning. We want to do oversight well. Uh, we want to have people labor in each other's lives well and oversee one another well. We want to minister to the people well. We want to train pastors. We want to do this. And uh, so we're just seeking to see uh, where God has guided us in this. And this is where we believe he's guided us at this point. So I just wanted to note that uh, as a continue from, from last week. And now Tom's going to come and share with uh, you as well. Oh, boy. All right. I want to read a text for us. Ryan uh, was betting I was going to read Matthew 28. It is in my list of texts to read, Ryan, and I knew all of you would be shocked by that. But I want to start with this text. And so if you look in Ephesians 3, Ephesians 3, Verse 20 and 21, and I really want us to just let verse 21 soak in for just a moment. Now to him who is able to do far abundantly more, or let's start again. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Now, if you uh, notice on the front of our bulletins, every Sunday we have a stated purpose. And the stated purpose of Cornerstone Community Church is to, pre is to present every man complete in Christ, empowered by his spirit and sustained by his grace in order that God might be glorified above all things. The vision out of which that purpose statement emerges is a vision for the glory of God. And we hear a lot about the glory of God and we may wonder, well, what is the glory of God? The scripture has a lot to say about God's glory. And in fact, the scripture presents the glory of God from different perspectives. So that the psalmist said in Psalm 19, 1, the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. But when we get to the New Testament, John said in John 1, 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then the writer of Hebrews says that he is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. So Christ declares the glory of God in a way that the heavens don't. God's glory is simply the outshining of his excellence. God's glory is the revelation of himself and the communication of himself to his creatures. And he has done that ultimately and perfectly in the Lord Jesus. So then how can we best glorify God? Well, as a church, we say that we can best glorify God in presenting every man complete in Christ. Now that implies a few things for us. It implies that our vision and our purpose is grounded in a high view of Christ as the ultimate revelation of God's <laughs> glory. Our purpose is grounded in the centrality of the church, in the pursuit of God's glory. We must do that together. It's, it's not an individual sport. Together as the church, glory comes to God throughout all generations forever and ever, Paul said in Ephesians 3. Also, you'll notice that this purpose is grounded in an utter dependence on the Holy Spirit's gifting for the fulfillment of the Great Commission. 
So this is how we're going to bring glory to God through the church. Now, early on, I became convinced of two things. One, I became convinced that God intends for the church to take the gospel to the nations. And by the nations, uh, we're referring to the ethno-linguistic people groups of the world. There are about 12,000 of those, uh, if you're not counting some dialects. And then another thing that I became convinced of is that God intends for the church to take the gospel to the nations for his own glory. Now, we can't take these things in isolation because they go together. The church is to take the gospel to the nations, but for what reason? Is it because we're focused on the peoples of the world and uh, we have some kind of great sentiment for people and for their plight? Well, hopefully we do, but that's no reason to take the gospel to the world. We take the gospel to the world in pursuit of a vision of the glory of God. If we focus on men, then our whole approach becomes dysfunctional. It becomes people-centered rather than God-centered, and it's less than glorifying to God. Now, both of these realities, taking the gospel to the world and doing it simply because of the glory of God, have become things that have shaped my life and my worldview. And in fact, it's become the way that I view the world and the lens through which I view the church. Now, uh, some may ask, well, you know, we're talking about global things then. What about here? And that's a good question. I want you to understand when I talk about taking the gospel to the globe, I'm speaking comprehensively. I'm as concerned today for children in our Sunday school as I am for unreached tribes in the mountains of Central Asia. The Great Commission is a both and. It's not an either or. And you can't do one to the neglect of the other. If you do one to the neglect of the other, how then can you say that we have rightly understood the gospel and the mandate under which the Great Commission has been given to us? We have to feel the weight of what Christ has commanded us to do. It is a both and commission. Now, there are a, a few things, and I think we can't assume that everyone just simply buys in to the fact that the church is to take the gospel to the nations, and that includes uh, even to our own town, uh, to our own families, to our own extended families, to the far reaches of the earth. I don't think we can assume that everybody automatically buys into that. So what I want to do is just make some applications for us, or a few observations, and then some applications. And the first is that we must embrace the missionary role of the church in the world. Not only must we embrace it, but we must teach it to each other, and we must teach the missionary role of the church in the world to our children. We can't think, we can no longer think of the missionary task of the church as uh, belonging specifically to a group of people that we call missionaries. Now, we do hope and pray that God will raise up people among us and send them to the far reaches of the earth. That is a biblical thing. God does it. He uh, especially gifts people for that task, to give their lives to that task. We want to be a part of training and aiding those people on whom God places that call uh, we want to be a part of aiding them to go to the nations of the world. But you can't say then that missions is not my task. It is your task. It's my task. It's our task as a church. Now, I want to argue that simply from this perspective. For, uh, for many years, the church had no missionary sending agency. In fact, the church in the first 300 years of its existence evangelized the Roman Empire to the extent that 
every aspect of society was permeated by believers. And even in Paul's time, Caesar's household was permeated by believers and they did it without any missionary sending agency. And how they did that was that the church simply viewed itself as apostolic in orientation. And they pursued a vision of the glory of God among the nations of the world. And thus, they took the gospel uh, to the known world or the Roman world in their day. The rise of the missionary society came about for the same reason the theological school arose, primarily due due to the failure of the church to simply be the church. Now, I'm not opposed to missionary sending organizations. I love them. I was a part of one for a number of years, um, and I still uh, love missionary sending organizations, and especially the IMB. I'm partial to them. Uh, they were such a blessing to my life. But, uh, you know, the fact remains, the fact remains that we could, uh, we could argue, well, due to the rise of the seminary, the academy, and due to the rise of the missionary sending agency, uh, the advance of the gospel has been enhanced in the world. And I will agree with that. That is absolutely true. But I would argue, and I've never had anyone disagree, that if we're going to full, fulfill the Great Commission, if we're going to feel the weight of that in the church, we're going to have to notch it up a bit. The church is going to have to own its training purpose, and it's going to have to own its missionary purpose in the world. So that what has to happen today for Great Commission fulfillment is there has to be a more strict partnership between the missionary sending agency and the local church, and between the educational institution and the local church, so that the church has a vital role in training its people for the work of missions and has a vital partnership with missionary sending agencies so that the church has a vital role in the training of its members and a strict partnership with seminaries and educational institutions so that we together can begin to multiply and decentralize and mobilize what we're doing to take the gospel to the nations of the world. And I think We'll see that come to pass as the days go by. The Holy Spirit mobilizes the church. And so as a church, we need to feel the weight of the Spirit mobilizing us in every possible way to take the gospel to the nations of the world. Now, I raised this point a few weeks ago when we prayed for Andy and Laura. And I said that they need no justification to do what they're doing. But we need a gospel advancing justification for staying. The Great Commission belongs no less to one than it does to the other. So the question becomes then, why am I here? Now, some may say, well, it seems like you guys just want the church to get big. Well, our plan is not that the church be big or small. Our plan is to do what God lays before us to do. Now, we've already argued. You can say, well, let's plant churches. As Nate said, it doesn't work. As Lee just said, all that's going to do is make us grow. And we do intend to plant churches locally and internationally. And through the apprentice program, we're training uh, men as efficiently, <coughs> as effectively, and as quickly as we possibly can. But the bigness or smallness of the church is not a question. In fact, it's not in our purview. God hasn't given us the privilege to sit in judgment over his church and decide what size it ought to be. The question, the question that we have to feel the weight of, the question that's closer to us, 
is simply, how is God going to use me in this place for his glory in the advance of the gospel? Now, there are two kinds of people that God brings to this church. He brings people to this church that he's going to send out. And he brings people to this church that are going to stay for the duration. And you know which kind we need? Both. It's all in God's plan. So that what we're to do, this gets to the gifting of the Spirit among us, that's not only uh, in our stated purpose, but biblical. The Spirit gifts us. He gave gifts to the church in order that we may pour our lives into each other to ready each other for what God has for us to do in this world for His glory. So that my task in this church is not to worry about how big or how small it is. My task is to pour my life into my brothers and sisters, realizing that God is preparing them for a task that will advance the gospel in the world and bring glory to Him. On the other side of that, my brothers and sisters have to pour themselves into me in order that my faith may be strengthened and in order that I may be ready for what God is going to do with me. Now, when I was uh, about to uh, finish seminary, I had a, a seminary career, uh, but when I was about to finish, I was taking Romans, and uh, this might have been a year or two before I finished, but I was taking Romans, and it was in that Romans class when we were in chapter 1 that I started daydreaming and I uh, haven't woken up yet. <laughs> because it was in that text that God really made me feel the weight of His glory in what He intends to do through the church. And it was like somehow I just became a person who was enthralled by Paul's missionary vision. And so I want you to hear uh, what Paul says in Romans 1. Now I want you to look at verse 5. This is where I caught Paul's vision. He's talking about the gospel in Romans 1, 5, and he says, through whom we have received grace and apostleship. Apostleship. Notice he's talking plural. He's talking about the apostolic orientation of the church, what the church is to be doing in the world, and more specifically about his own unique apostleship. But we can't leave the other out of it. Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the peoples of the world. What was Paul's driving vision? The glory of God. Now notice how it plays out when you go on down and you look, say, in verse 8. For I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking somehow by God's will that I may at last succeed in coming to you. Why? For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. Why? Back up here in verse 5. To bring the nations to the obedience of faith. What's going on in the church? Did it stop there? Was this Paul the Apostle blowing into Rome to bless everyone? Well, it's more than that. Notice what he says. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Paul says, I need to be strengthened. I need to be encouraged by the gifts of the Spirit in the church. And you need to be encouraged by the gifts of the Spirit in my apostleship. And what is the purpose of that? Notice what he says. He says, I want you to know, brothers, 
that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been for prevented, in order that I may re uh, reap some harvest among you at, as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. So you can see Paul's gospel advancing orientation in the church and through the church. And he goes on to say, I am under obligation to both Greeks and the barbarians, to both the wise and the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. We are under obligation to the nations of the world. Now we're back to my admonition. We're here not to worry about how big or how small the church is, but we're here to pour our lives into each other so that we'll be readied and poised for what God intends to do among us. Now, do you see this vision in, uh, in our statement of purpose as a church? Notice, let's look back in, uh, in fact, we'll find our statement of purpose in Ephesians chapter 4, if you want to look there with me. Verse 11 and following, and he gave some, or and he gave the apostles, the prophets, evangelists, and pastors, and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, and so on. This is our stated purpose as a church. And do you realize that what is going on here is God is about mobilizing a gospel advancing force in the world. And notice that in Paul's view of the church, he's not talking about just the church that is. He's talking about the church that will be. Why are we here? Not for just what we see, but for what is going to be. Listen to what Paul said when he wrote to Timothy. In uh, 2 Timothy 2.10, Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect. He's talking about the church. That they may obtain salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. He's not only talking about those who have believed, but those who will believe. Not the church that simply is, but the church that will be. We have to have that far-reaching vision. So we must embrace the missionary role of the church. Part of fulfilling the Great Commission is pouring your lives into each other in every way possible so that we'll be strengthened in our faith and poised for what God intends to do among us. Now, uh, let's move on to another implication. Implication two, not only the missionary role of the church in the world, but then we have to realize that the terminal point of missions is the glory of God. Many people think that the ministry of the church terminates on them. And it doesn't. We cannot get at helping people by focusing on helping people. We have to become a people who pursue the glory of God because when we pursue the glory of God, when I turn my view from myself and I turn my view to my brothers and sisters, seeking God's glory in their lives through the church, when that happens, it does me good. William Wilberforce wrote that the glory of God is the grand maxim that governs all of life. 
He said that for the good of society, the good of society must not be the primary good. Rather, he thought, seek the glory of God in society and society will be done good. Seek the glory of God in the church and the church will be done good. So we have to become uh, focused on the glory of God in the world. And I think this is what Jesus was talking about when he said, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. And then again, he made this radical statement. There's no one who's left houses or brothers or sisters or mothers or fathers or children for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now and this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. I think we just kind of brush over those statements. He made uh, other such radical statements as well. And we have to hear it in the ear of the first century. It would have been just completely revolutionary. What do you mean? How can you leave your father and mother and your brothers and your sisters and your children for the sake of the gospel? How in the world can you do that? If you're born an Israelite, what's better than that? It's, it's strange talk. It's radical talk. But it's about not focusing on ourselves, rather seeing the glory of God as the terminal point of mission. So, the glory of God is the terminal point of mission. Three, the church brings glory to God by advancing the gospel. We must preach the gospel to each other and to everybody else. The reason that brings glory to God is because it's not about what I can do for you or what you can do for me, but it's about what only God can do for us. Amen. That's what we're glorying in. I'm not saying be like me. I'm saying your only hope is Jesus. My only hope is Christ. So then church planting, planting the church is not about the advance of the church and church growth is not about the bigness of the church, but church planting and church growth are about bringing glory to God through the gospel because only He can do for us what needs done. So missions then, the fourth implication is that missions seeks to bring glory to God through the advance of the gospel by the multiplication of churches. When I talk about planting churches, my fear is that we'll all think of something outside of this body. And we ought to think that to an extent. But what we're doing right here in this body is planting the church. We're always in a mode of planting the church. We never finish with that. And so we're going to do it here. And then we're going to do it other places. And we want to plant the church everywhere because the vision is that God is glorified. Paul said in Ephesians 3, through the advance of the gospel in the church throughout all ages and throughout all generations. So the Great Commission then is not simply about telling everybody about Jesus. When Jesus said to disciple the nations, he's not saying go everywhere and tell everybody about me. The Great Commission has as its context the establishing of the church so that when we disciple the nations, the way he outlined that we are to do that is by what? Going? Baptizing? What do we do when we baptize? We bring people into the church. We're not just rounding up people to go to every stream in the county and put them under the water. There's no merit in that. We're bringing people into the church through baptism. So Jesus squarely 
has in view in the Great Commission this idea of establishing the church. We do it by, we disciple the nations by going, by baptizing, and by teaching. And it's in that context that Jesus said, I'll be with you even unto the end of the age. We have no right to think that Jesus is with us if we're not about that because that's what He's about in the world and He's not going to change for us. Okay, now some implications. Number one, we must order our lives for the glory of God and the good of the church. We must order our lives for the glory of God and the good of the church. We can't do one without doing the other. This life is not permanent. Church is not just something we do on Sunday. It is who we are. We are the church. Our church family is permanent. It's eternal. All of our other family relationships are temporary. They're for this world. They're for good purpose. But they're not ultimate. Now, our families are analogous of the gospel. But the problem comes when the type supplants the reality. When the family becomes ultimate. Now, my fear is that someone's going to hear me say that I think families don't matter. We ought to neglect them for the gospel and uh, get about God's work in the world. Not so. But rather, I think understanding the temporary nature of our family relationships is vital if we're going to enjoy the fulfillment of those relationships in eternity. We must view them rightly here if we're going to reap the benefit there. Now, a second fear that I have is that when I say family, some people are going to hear me say, well, if you're single, then you have no powerful analogy of the gospel in your life. And that's not so. I think if you're single, your lives more directly picture union with Christ. So order singleness and order families for the good of the church. Remind each other that our family relationships are temporary but they do have ultimate meaning. And I think this is what Jesus was getting at in Mark 10 when he said, If a man is left, father or mother, brothers or sisters, lands or houses, for my sake and the gospel. I think it was what he, he was getting at in Luke 9 when he told a man who came to him, You let the dead bury the dead and you go preach the gospel. I think it was what Jesus was getting at when from the cross he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. I don't think it's simply making provision for his mother. I think it's much deeper. I think he's talking about the church. And he's saying, here is your permanent family in the church. So we live a life today that I think calls for extreme measures. And so I want to challenge you, if you're single, to realize the mission of singleness. We live in the last days, radical days, so that the Old Testament command to be fruitful and multiply has given away to the New Testament command to disciple the nations. Jesus was single. I don't think any of us would say he violated the command to be fruitful and multiply. Look at us. 
What is the fruit of his life? Paul was single. No one could accuse the rabbi of not obeying the law of God. Look at the churches that he planted. Where was that fulfillment of his life? It was in the church so that he poured his life into it and he endured everything for the sake of God's elect. I think we're getting at what Jesus meant when he said if you leave father and mother, he's not talking about that select few who go off to the mission field and they experience separation from their immediate family. He's talking about everybody. And he's saying, this is my demand of everybody. You have to understand, what is the permanent family? Build it. Own it. Don't deny it. Don't try not to think about it. Tyndale never married. He spent the last 12 years of his life in exile from his homeland. At age 30, he had to flee England. And until he was 42, he lived in loneliness, cold, hunger, and poverty. And finally, he was arrested, betrayed, arrested, and sentenced to death. And what was his crime? He translated the Bible into English. Sorry, rascal. <coughs> Do you notice how, how radical that is? How radical his life was? We don't think it's so radical because we just have it. Tyndale was blow the doors off, cutting edge, radical for Christ. He defied the King of England. And he suffered for it. So that at 42, he was strangled, burned, and never buried. I want you to realize the mission of singleness. Now, you look at the life of Tyndale, and do you think he's lacking anything in the kingdom of God? Do you think that somehow he doesn't have children? Tyndale gave us the Bible. And I want to tell you, every time you open this English text up, just for the next month, take a moment and reflect. And try to picture in your mind a little man tied to a post with a rope around his neck being strangled for it. And see what that does to your soul. Pour your lives into each other. This is your eternal family. And look at it. It's taking shape right before our very eyes. Now you may say, I may not care much for some of my family members. <laughs> well, every family has them, right? <laughs> God's saying to you, I put them here to pull that sin out of your heart. I teach you to love your brothers and sisters and pour yourself into them. So we need to realize the mission of singleness. Then we need to realize the mission of marriage. 
Your marriage is an analogy of the gospel. It points to something beyond itself. I spend time thinking about the temporary nature of my marriage and my fatherhood. And I want you to know that those thoughts do not lead me to neglect my wife and my children and my grandchildren, but rather they aid me to be rightly related to them. Because I realize the import. What's important, what's really important is what's coming after, here, after this life. So I want to move from the type to the reality. And I want to move them from that type to that reality. We can't make our children the center of the world and lead them to Christ. They'll not embrace a Savior whom they feel is less important than themselves. If you lose your family for His sake in the Gospel, you'll find it. We try to exalt marriage and family is the ultimate. And when we do, we bring all kinds of dysfunction into it. We have to order our lives and our families and our children's lives for the glory of God in this world. And when they ask why, we need to tell them of the greatness of Jesus. Before my wife and before my children and with them, I pursued Christ. And that pursuit put us in places and situations that demanded suffering and hardship. But there was never any doubt as to why. There's a grander vision for this. And it's Christ. I want to be like Christ to my wife. Anymore, we're like left brain and right brain. Takes two of us at our age to have a complete brain. <laughs> Takes both of us to find each other's glasses, to fix each other's lunch, to prepare a meal, to clean the house, to be where we're supposed to be at the right time and on the right day. Left brain and right brain. That's who we are. She's been involved in every decision I've ever made. I value her opinions. I love to see her make decisions with spiritual maturity that have simple trust in Jesus. Because I want to hear Jesus say to me one day, she's more beautiful now than when I gave her to you. but I can't get there by pursuing her. I've enjoyed my children as much as any human can. And at their age, in my age, I've started to talk to them more about the ultimate meaning of this temporary relationship. And my thought is, it's been so good to be their father that what the ultimate reality of it's going to be in the kingdom of God is going to be great. Now there's good news. Maybe you were abandoned by your father, your husband, your wife, your children, your parents. Those relationships are not ultimate. They do not have power over your life. There's an ultimate family. There's an ultimate father. We have a wonderful brother. Your family is right here. Just a couple things quickly and then we're going to pray and have to go. Okay. 
I'm finished. <laughs> we need to give ourselves in service to the church for the glory of God. We're going to need additional children's Sunday school classes. We need couples and singles to be mentored, to teach, to train, to be ready to do uh, family evangelistic endeavors out in the communities and in neighborhoods with other children who are unchurched. It calls for preparation. God's going to call some of you to ministries that will remove you from this body. You need to prepare to do that. God does not want you to go be a missionary or go be a pastor and not prepare. And he's given you opportunities to do that. We want to encourage you to stay right here. To stay in this body that can build a network with you and aid you in your growth and development and aid you in making the decisions that you're going to make about what you're going to do with your life and what direction it's going to take. We want to build like-minded relationships, our, our relationships with like-minded missionaries and pastors and churches for the purpose of mutual training and encouragement, develop that network and maintain it to the ends of the earth, both locally and internationally. We have an incredible array of international experience sitting in this room that we are not tapping into as a church. We have like-minded, potential like-minded partners globally that we can connect our members to so that they can have significant domestic and international experience as they prepare for the calling that God has placed on their life. Last month, our internet site was hit by 32 nations of the world. God can use that in ways that we cannot dream for His glory. We need a more strict and costly partnership with mission sending agencies and with educational institutions so that we can partner together with a like-minded vision to plant churches to the ends of the earth and to train workers who are so inclined. This is what we need as a church. We need to pour our lives into those people who are going to go out to the last remaining about 500 people groups in the world who have no access to the gospel, who have never heard the gospel, who have no scripture, who have nothing. They're out there and they're going to be the hardest to reach because they are the last to reach. We need to pour our lives into each other so that we may be ready for that task. And I think we'll pray and go. Father, thank you. For this time together, you're so kind to us to let us uh, have these moments. We ask your blessing as we go and hear your word proclaimed, and we pray in Jesus' name.